message again. I'm going to live dangerously. I'll tell you the story of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He was a 34-year-old school teacher. He was a colonel in the Union Army. July the 2nd, 1863, he was in the battle for his life. 80,000 northern troops scattered across the hills and fields leading to a little town called Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And he was at the end of the line of those 80,000 men. He was given strict orders. You hold this hill at all costs. If it costs you your life, you hold this hill. If it costs you every man that you have, you hold this hill. This hill is the key to the battle. The rebels take this hill, the battle will be lost. They will control the high ground. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain in the 20th Maine knew what their job was. 2.30 in the afternoon, two Alabama regiments charged that hill. They were driven back down. They charged a second, a third, and a fourth time. Fourth time, a bullet was fired that hit Chamberlain. But it happened to hit him in the belt buckle. It knocked him down, surprised him, scared him, but he was okay. He stood up and rallied his troops. They charged a fifth time. This time they made it to the wall. And there was hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but somehow Chamberlain and his men drove them back down the hill. They were preparing to make a sixth charge up that hill. The rebels knew that hill was the key to the battle too. As they were preparing to make their charge, Chamberlain surveyed his men. He started with 300 that morning. He was down to 80 men. He asked around about, about their condition and their weapons, and most of them were out of ammunition as they were preparing for the Confederates to charge one final time. Chamberlain gave a command, fix bayonets. His men didn't move. Is he crazy? Fix bayonets? He said it again. They put the bayonets on their guns. And then he commanded an all-out charge down the hill. They charged down the hill, caught the rebels by surprise, captured about 300, but they held their hill. Historians tell us that if Chamberlain had not held that hill, the Confederates would have won that battle, and if they won that battle, they would have won the war by midsummer. That was the key to the Civil War, and Chamberlain stood his ground. The Bible talks to us about standing our ground, holding the ground that we've been given. I want to start in the book of Psalms, and I want you to read with me through the Psalms. I don't know if you like Psalms like I do, but I have fallen in love with that book. It applies so well to our lives and to the struggles that we have, and David captures so well the goodness of our God. Let's start in Psalm 16. We'll read just a few. There's, there's hundreds, literally hundreds of passages in the Psalms that talk about our feet and talk about standing and talk about not being moved. We're just going to notice a couple of them. We'll start in Psalm 16 and then go to 18 and a few more from there. But Psalm 16 and verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Psalm 18. Look at verse 32. It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets, my, sets me on high places. I've done a lot of hunting, not a lot of deer hunting. I grew up small game hunting, rabbit, squirrel hunting, dove hunting. But I did a little bit of deer hunting. And I still get excited when I'm walking down a path in the woods and see a big deer print there in that mud. I imagine how big he must be to leave that print there in that dirt. And I long for the morning when I can come back and watch for him and hopefully he'll step out and I'll get a shot at him. David said, God made my feet like a deer's feet. Now that's kind of strange if you picture it, but the Mosier would say, if you put deer feet on the bottom of us, that wouldn't make much sense, wouldn't seem very good to us. But if you ever watched a deer, go up a bank or go up a hill. They get up it a lot better than we do. And David said, God gave me the feet of a deer. He said, I can grab the ground and I can hold the ground. But notice again, Psalm 40. Psalm 40 as David continues. Psalm 40 
Psalm 40 and verse 2. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon the rock, and established my steps. Psalm 66. Your turn there next. Psalm 66. And verse 9. Who keeps our soul from for who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. Does not allow our feet to be moved. Plant my feet on higher ground. That's our topic. And God's able to do that. God's able to make us stand. One of my favorite passages in the book of Romans is Romans 14, verse 4. It's talking about the weak brother. It says, Who are we to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or he falls. And then it says this, God is able to make him stand. Here's the weak brother. Here's the brother who isn't as strong as everybody else is. But God's able to make him stand. If God's able to make the weak brother stand, don't you think He's able to make you and me stand? If we're willing to, if our heart is in it, if we're courageous enough to step out, God can make us stand. God can get us to hold our ground. Romans 8 and verse 31, If God be for us, who can be against us? I've got to remind myself, anything I do that I do for God, I'm not doing it by myself. God goes with me. He's promised I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Paul would say in Acts 20 and verse 24, None of these things move me. Why? Because I know who I have believed. I'm persuaded, 2 Timothy 1.12, that he's going to keep what I've committed to his hand. Romans 8, 34 through 39, the end of the context there. Who can separate us from the love of God? And then he mentions all these terrible things. He says, But all these things were more than conquerors. No man's able to pull us apart from God. We can walk away from God. We can leave God. But if we're determined to stay with God, no man can separate us from God. You know, we, we, we preach so much against the false doctrine of once saved, always saved, that we, we go through life not feeling saved. We go through life kind of hedging and worried and concerned. And yet, if I'm committed to God, He's committed to me. And He's going to make me stand. He's going to keep me from falling. He's going to keep me where I need to be doing what I need to do if I'll just trust in God. I want to give you some Bible stories today that I hope they mean as much to you as they do to me. Some of the stories are stories we, we don't know very well. I don't know them very well. And in researching and looking at this lesson, I was impressed by them. Let's go first of all to Numbers chapter 16. This is about Aaron. And I've, I've got a confession to make to you today. Aaron is not one of my favorite Bible characters. There are favorite Bible characters like you do, but Aaron, he's never been on that list. Jacob's not on that list. Jacob was a beguiler. He was a supplanter. And there's just some things about Jacob. I'm wondering how in the world could God use you? But God found a way to do it. In fact, if you get to John chapter 1, Jesus is going to say to Nathaniel, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no God. What he's saying is, Behold a Jacob in whom there's no Jacob. You're a descendant of Jacob, but you're very different than Jacob. There's no guile in you because Jacob had plenty of guile in him. What a compliment Jesus gave that man. But Aaron... Think about the golden calf. Aaron, he had a part in that. Think about speaking against Moses because of the wife that he took. There's just some things about Aaron that, that bother me, but if I'm going to talk bad about him, I ought to show you the good about him. So let's look at Numbers chapter 16. Let me show you something good about Aaron. He did something I'm not sure I would be willing to do or I would struggle to do. Let me set the stage for you in Numbers chapter 16. Corridatham and Abiram have... They have challenged the leadership of Moses. They have challenged his authority. And they, they say that Moses has taken too much upon himself. And so God says, okay, this is what we're going to do. You get them to come out here tomorrow with their censors. And they stand before the Lord. And we'll let the Lord decide this. We'll let the Lord decide if Moses has taken too much on himself. Because God's the one that set it up this way. So these men come out and they stand before the Lord. And God causes something to happen that's never happened before. The earth opens up its mouth and swallows them alive. That's the background of what we're talking about. Well, you would think after you've seen that, there wouldn't be any more complaining out of anybody. 
But look at the context. Look at the context of what the children of Israel. Verse 41 of number 16. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. The very next day, they're complaining about Moses the same way that Korah, Dathan, and Abiram had complained about Moses. And here's what God says. Look at verse 45. Get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. God says, Moses and Aaron, back up. I'm not done. I got 250 yesterday. I'm going to get more today. We're going to get rid of these murmurs and we're going to get rid of these complainers once and for all. By the time this day is over, 14,000 more will be dead. God doesn't like murmuring and God doesn't like complaining. God's not going to tolerate it. You go home and you complain about the elders, you remember this story. You go home and complain about the preacher and his family, you remember this story. Because the God in heaven, He's listening. And if they're doing God's work, God's not happy. He may not open up the earth, but one day He's going to open up the bar of judgment. One day you're going to stand there. You better be careful. It's a serious thing to complain about those that God has put in positions to do certain work. So look at verse 46. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer and put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses had commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. I like that phrase. He stood between the dead and the living. How would you like to have been Aaron when Moses said, get your censer and go? And you're running toward the plague. God's already said, back up. God's already said, let me finish what I started. Now you're running toward the plague. You got a, a sensor and you're trying to get fire in it and you're trying to put incense in it and you're trying to do all that just as quickly as you can because people are dying as you're running. And you're running toward the plague. And he gets to a point where he's standing between the living and the dead. Today I'm standing between the living and the dead. I've got to always remember when I stand in this pulpit, I'm standing between the living and the dead. I'm standing in a position that God has put me to be in to deliver His Word, to try to stop the plague, to try to help people to be saved. Standing between the living and the dead. Aaron was willing to stand, and because of that, God caused him to stand. And the plague was stopped and people were saved. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. We read about Gideon. Let me tell you, Gideon's another one of those. I'm picking some odd characters today. And Gideon in Judges chapter 6 isn't convinced that God really wants him to do something. And so he's asking God, God, if you want me to do this, if you're really going to deliver them into our hands, then this is what I want you to do. I want the dew to fall on this rug... And not on the earth. And then I'll know this is what you want me to do. And so God does that. And Gideon says, God, don't get angry with me. But God, this time, let the rug be dry and let the ground be wet. Gideon says, God, have you seen all these Midianites? They're like the grasshoppers. They're covering the hills and they're devouring everything. And God, they're going to devour us. God, I want to make sure before I step out that you're going to be there for me. That you're going to defend me. That you're going to help me stand. God gave him the assurance he needed. And so in Judges chapter 7, Gideon is going to stand. Now Gideon feels pretty good about it. At least my thinking is. Gideon said, yeah, I've got to stand. But I've got 32,000 people with me. God said, Gideon, that's too many. Too many. God, have you seen the Midianites or grasshoppers scattered all over? It's too many. You'll claim victory on the basis of how many people you have. 
God says, you make an announcement. Those that are fearful and afraid go home. 22,000 walked away. He's down to 10,000. You can imagine Gideon going, whoa, whoa, whoa. The, 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 the Midianites, they're not going down any. It's my soldiers that are going down. I want the Midianites to go down. I want mine to go up. God said, no, that's not where we're doing things. Still too many. Too many. God, have you seen the Midianites? Too many. Go down to the river. Those that are going to have a test. And those that do a certain thing, those who are the ones that are chosen, those who do something else, they'll be rejected. By the time the day is over, he's down to 300 soldiers. Those that lap water like the dog are the only ones that are selected. Gideon says, still got 300. A lot of Midianites, but I got 300. God says, well, here's what I want you to do. You put a trumpet in your right hand, you put a pitcher and a lamp in your left hand, and you go surround the Midianites. God, that's what you want me to do? That's what I want you to do. God, what about the sword? I'll be your sword. You announce the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. Now, how would you like to have been surrounding the Midianites with a trumpet in one hand and a pitcher and a lamp in the other one? If you're willing to stand, God's able to make you stand. But who's willing to stand like that? Gideon was. And what happened when Gideon blew the trumpet? And when they broke the pitchers? What did the Midianites do? They lost their minds. They looked up there and saw those lamps shining. They thought, we are surrounded. And they began to kill each other in the, in the, in the melee of the situation. If you're willing to stand, God can make you stand. Let's go to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. You know this story. The other two have been kind of unusual to you, but this one's not unusual to you. This is David and Goliath. Before we get to David and Goliath, though, let me tell you another story. A story about a nine-year-old football player. His name was Bo Esom. He loved football. He wanted to be a, a safety. In fact, when he was nine years old, he drew a picture of himself in his uniform. It wasn't a really good picture, but he wrote at the bottom of it an NFL safety. Well, he went out for football, and the coach looked at him, and he wasn't too impressed by him. He's just five feet tall, 100 pounds. And the coach said, you, you, you're not big enough to play football. You might ought to choose another sport. So he goes home. His dad said, well, how did... How did practice go today? And he said, well, the coach didn't think I was big enough to play. And his dad leaned down. His dad said, did he measure your heart? No, dad, he didn't measure my heart. And his dad said, let me tell you a story. He said, a rancher has a dog. The dog has puppies. That rancher, the very first day, he identifies the runt of the litter. And he ties a piece of yarn around that runt's neck. He waits 12 weeks and he gives all the puppies away but one. Guess which one he keeps? He keeps the runt. Why does he keep the runt? He's basing his whole future on that one that was a runt. Why is he doing that? Because that runt is a fighter. He's a worker. He's had to work harder. He's had to fight more. He's had to be more determined. He's had to be smarter. He's the best one of the litter. Because he's got the heart to be the best. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're reading about the man who had the heart to be king. David had the heart to be king. Saul's army's been camped. The Philistines have been camped. And every day for 40 days, Goliath has walked down into the valley, the champion of the Philistines. He's challenged Israel. And Israel doesn't have anybody, including Saul, who will come down and meet him until David comes to visit his brothers. David hears the challenge. Now what can you tell me about David? The text will tell you David was small and ruddy. He was the runt of the pack. He was the youngest of Jesse's boys. But here's the run of the pack. He has the heart to be king. He comes down there and he is the one that's going to fight Goliath. Now what does Goliath think of? Well, let's start with what does Joe David's brothers think about him coming down. 
Well, they, they think he's just come down to see the battle. Saul doesn't think much of him. You're just a youth. You're not able to go out and meet this man of war. What does Goliath think about David? You're a better match for my armor bearer than for me. I'm going to tear you up and I'm going to feed you to the birds of heaven. This is what David says in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want you to look at his words. Verse 45, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with a sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you, give you into our hands. The battle is the Lord's. David knew, we've already read what David said in the Psalms, David knew if I'm willing to stand, God will plant my feet. If I'm willing to stand, God will help me to stand and not be moved. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, stand, 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 the Bible says. And David was willing to stand and God's going to help him to stand. Goliath's not going to be able to move him because he's committed to standing up for God. Do you have the heart that David had? Do you have a heart that's willing to step out and stand and meet the challenge of the enemy? Meet the challenge of Goliath? I read a book this last year. It was entitled, Goliath Must Fall. It's by a man named Louis Giglio. Very interesting book. It challenged me in a, in a way that never been challenged by this story before. I've always read the story of David and Goliath without realizing that there's a bigger story. And the bigger story is a descendant of David who is fighting an even worse giant. He's been sent by his father to check on his brethren. He's brought bread from home as well. It's 40 days that have passed before he meets this giant in battle. But he's going to defeat this giant and deliver his people. You know, David was in a contest that if he won, then the Philistines would be their servants, but if the giant won, then the Israelites would be their servants. When Jesus Christ came to this world, He came to deliver us from the giant and the fear of death that He had imposed upon us. And if Jesus had lost, we would have been Satan's servants forever. But because Jesus won, We've spoiled the enemy. We've routed his camp. Because Jesus was willing to stand, we enjoyed the victory. I want one more example for you. I want you to go to <laughs> Acts chapter 9. This is another man that we don't talk about very much, but he is a man who was willing to stand. And because he was willing to stand, God planted his feet. Acts chapter 9, of course, we're, we're the background of this chapter is Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 8 and verse 3 says, He made havoc of the church, hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Read about in Acts 7, the death of Stephen. That's all in the background of what we're talking about. In Acts chapter 9, though, Saul of Tarsus is on the road to Damascus. He sees a bright light. He hears a voice. He's told to go into the city, and there he will be told what he must do. And then this is where we pick up the story, the, our part of the story of the man who was willing to stand, this man named Ananias. It says in verse 13, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. So God's told Ananias, i got a job for you. I want you to go. Here's the location. I want you to go and I want you to meet with a man named Saul. Ananias says, Lord, I've heard about that man. I've heard about him from a lot of people. And I've heard about all the harm that he's done. 
Look at what God says. Verse 15, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. We're going to pick up the story in Acts 22, but I want you to see that God says, Ananias, I know this man too. You know him for what he has done. I know him for what he's going to do. You know him for the harm he's done. I know him for the harm that's going to come to him. Go to Acts 22. And I want you to look at the language of the text. Acts 22. Of course, you know there are three accounts of the conversion of Saul. Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. Acts 22 is the one that contains the statement, Arise and wash away your sins, call in the name of the Lord. But before we get there, look at verse 12. Saul is recording his own conversion. He's Paul by now. Verse 12, Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood. I've thought about a lot of situations I've been in preaching, and I've thought about a lot of visits I've had to make, and I've thought about a lot of uncomfortable situations I've been in, but I've never been in a situation like this. I've never been told by God, you go to a man who's killed many, you stand in his presence and you preach my word to him, you tell him what to do. Because Ananias was willing to go and he was willing to stand, God converted Saul of Tarsus. And then Saul of Tarsus is going to convert many, many people as a result of that. Plant my feet on higher ground. When we're willing to step out, we're willing to seek that higher ground, then God can make us stand in the higher ground and nobody, no one, can drive us off of it. If we had more time today, we would have talked about 2 Samuel 23. That's, oh, that's my favorite. David's mighty men. They're men, you don't know their names, hard to pronounce their names, but they were men who, sometimes they were 800 to 1, and they stood. Sometimes the rest of the army of Israel fled, and they were the only ones that were there, and they stood. God won great victories through these men. My favorite of the whole group is a man named Benaiah. He fought two lion-like men of Moab. He also fought a lion in a pit on a snowy day. He fought the worst beast in the worst place under the worst conditions. And he's the one that came out of the pit. But then the Bible says that he faced another giant who was an extraordinary man. And this other giant had a spear and he had only a staff. He went down and met this giant with this spear, him having only a staff. Somehow he took that staff, he took the spear away from his opponent, and he killed the opponent with his own spear. David said, you're in charge of my bodyguard. You killed two lion-like men. You killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day and you took a spear away from a man and killed him with it. You're the kind of guy who watching out for me. But why? Because Benaiah was a man that said, if, if I will do what God tells me to do, God will make me stand. God will plant my feet. I need to be reminded of that. Because sometimes I have to preach sermons that I know are not going to be well received. I have to preach sermons because God told me to preach them. I'm preaching the preaching that He told me to preach. And I know there are people who are going to meet me at the back door. I know sometimes there are people that are going to squirm in the pew. I know sometimes there are people that are going to get together after I preach that lesson to decide what they need to do about it. But if I will stand, God will keep me from being moved from that high ground. Always take the high ground and God will make you stand. Thank you for your attention.